special edition of In the Reading Corner today, an international edition. I am so thrilled to be welcoming Joellen Bogart and Maya Kasselik. We're going to be talking about their joint creative project, Anthony and the Gargoyle. It's a book that I fell in love with very quickly. So Joellen, I'm going to start with you because people might not realise that wordless books have writers. I hadn't thought of that. (laughs) They don't just grow like mushrooms. Yes, I wrote it in my head. I just didn't put the words down. Is it almost like a script that you put together? How much direction goes into creating and writing a wordless book? As most authors know, we try not to be too bossy or step on toes of illustrators. But in this case, since there was no text, I actually did write it out scene by scene, more specific in some cases than in others. And some, I basically left it like a skeleton thing, like they became friends and played in his room. And Maya took it from there and it blossomed into a beautiful inside story to the story. So we're going to come on and think about all of that. But for our listeners, we should give them a little bit of a clue as to what this story is about. It started with a young couple in love in Paris, which seems very appropriate. And we see them dining at a restaurant. We see, we, we see her pick up a stone. It's a little hard to see the stone. Everybody look for it. And she takes that stone home with her. She has a baby. The stone goes on the bedside table of the little boy as he grows up. He loves that stone. (laughs) And one morning he awakes to find that it has broken open. And he doesn't know what was in it or what happened. But then we see, peeking out of the closet, a lovely little face. And that's how it begins. The little baby gargoyle. He later then asks his mother some questions that allow him to understand that she brought the rock home where it came from. And so we start wondering, what could this be? And so the adventure continues from there. What inspired you with the gargoyle? Gargoyles are fascinating. Mm. I'm guessing you don't have that many of them in Canada and the United Uh, States. A few. Once I came to Canada, I really did start looking up, you know, what's happening up there on the top of the building. And I remember many years ago, long before I thought of the story, I was reading about gargoyles and being fascinated by the artistic talents that went into making them. We all know that Notre Dame, which is where this particular gargoyle comes from, was devastated a few years ago by fire. Were you able to go up and do that chimera walk before yeah. that happened? Yes, I did that in 2008. That's quite a thing, isn't it, walking along that walkway with all of those amazing stone creatures? Yes, and apparently they were installed, I think, at different times over a number of years. And I even saw a picture once of Abraham Lincoln posing up there with a gargoyle. It's, it's crazy amazing. And when you look at Notre Dame, from some distance. It's like they're little specks along the gallery. So the whole thing is just beyond amazing. Let's come to Maya. What do you get from the publisher when you're asked to illustrate a book like this? Because it seems to me you've got a lot more freedom with a wordless book. Yes, I had all the freedom and support I could ask for. So this was really something really great. But I have to say that this wasn't the first wordless book I was working on. But the process was very different because the first book was my author's picture book. And it's the story is yours. It's a bit more intimate and uh, subconscious. You put on the content and the drawings very fluidly. While this was a completely new experience for me when I got Joellen's text, because the story wasn't mine, so I have to dive into it and to feel it like she did. And I really appreciated when she wrote these important scenes and details and clues. And also what was very important for me is that I got her notebooks. Like, was she imagining this would mean or 
why is this story important to her so it was very easy to, for me to get into the same feeling what did you pick up was important to her I really like when working on a book, not just this immediate story and what's happening, but also some deeper message or something more eternal. So I understood this is a story about magic, about fantasy, imagination, but also about compassion, friendship and sacrifice. As Maya's described it there, did she pick up what was important to you? I was stunned. I thought, oh my, my goodness, she understood everything, if not taking it a little further. I could tell it hit her very deeply. And I thought, oh, this is amazing. She understands perfectly. I want to talk a little bit about the, what I would call the tone of the book, the colouring of it, the very tender way in which the characters connect with each other. So this story could have felt very different with a different visual treatment. And I wondered whether you settled on that quite quickly or whether there was some experimentation, Maya, to get that feel of it right. Yeah, there was a lot of experimentation and uh, I failed two times. And I had this a very nostalgic feeling. I wished to set it in some kind of timelessness. That's why I used trains, because I thought uh, instead of planes, I asked Joanne if that's okay and my editors, because I wish to convey not that precise timing of the book. So also the colors and uh, the whole setting in Paris, I feel <clears throat> both old and timeless, and it was really important for me to convey. You've used very warm colors not very saturated, so that in a sense gives a feeling that it could be some time ago, but we don't know exactly when. The characters, mm -hmm. even though they're not in France, they feel very French to me. There's something about their styling that's quite French, I think. Let's have a look, because I want to talk a little bit about these first few pages and how you've conveyed time in the narrative here. And just to compare with Joellen about how you set up the time frame and how Maya chose to show it in the illustrations, because most of it's done through photograph rather than a narrative sequence. I thought that was so clever. I had talked about them sharing a photo album, but it was amazing to put them on the wall because then it showed how they felt about the photos. And also they could be seen from time to time without necessarily focusing on them. It wasn't like a book that was closed. It was on the wall. That was a major improvement over what I had said. And of course, then we could circle around and see the photo at the end. It it was wonderful artistic thinking. It was a visual thing that worked perfectly. Almost like watching a film. You can imagine the camera panning around. <laughs> I love the way that we didn't just focus on one photograph, that you had the things that are around it. It's leading you into the next photograph because we just catch the edges of a frame or the edges of another picture. What you're doing is being taken on a journey around this wall. I have to ask you, Maya, there are quite a few numbers that crop up in this book. We've got a 26 there and there's a 42 or something like later on. Are the numbers significant in any way? Yeah, these numbers are part of my intimate love or my personal hidden things. <laughs> There are birthdays of my sons or the people I love. Here is a, a robot painting, which is actually a painting from my painter friend from Slovenia. And uh, these details are something I I look in my ordinary life in my home. <laughs> and we're seeing a little glimpse of this family. The fact that you've got a sort of toy Volkswagen van, you get the feeling that they've enjoyed their travels in the past. I love this feeling that each object can be more than just something empty. And I love symbols and because picture books can be read by different people from children to older people. And it's really nice when you get different things for each of them. So I love layering. <laughs> I've become very interested in how readers engage with a wordless text sometimes. We want the children to put the story to it, but that's not necessarily what they want to do instinctively. So I try to 
imagine myself in that position when I was reading this book. And I found that I didn't tell myself a story. I didn't say once upon a time there was a house and the house looked like this. What I found myself doing was asking lots of questions as you've been sharing this book with readers. Do you have any observations as to how they read the book? Wordless books are, on one hand, very challenging for parents, and on the other, they can be more playful and open, and there are no boundaries or instructions to what to do do with them. So this freedom, it's also something that children really like. Joel, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to share the book. No, I haven't been able to share it. Oh, the questions I would have asked children in schools, I would like their reaction. I actually wrote my daughter and said, listen, can you read this to Astrid, please? <laughs> and ask her these questions because I have not had a child to discuss it with because yeah. of the pandemic. I wanted to come on to the pictures of Paris. It's an elderly aunt, isn't it, that they're going to visit who's sick. I don't know about you, Joellen, but when I saw these pictures of Paris, I was blown away because we've had lots of spreads with close-ups of characters, mm -hmm. quite a few images mm -hmm. on a spread. And then we open up to this double-page spread of the Gare du Nord with this wonderful <laughs> architectural detail, and I was blown away. Oh, I had the same reaction. I can feel that it's stone. The color is beautiful. I can't imagine how much care it took to create this image. A an interesting thing, as I remember, when I first con conceived of the book as a wordless book, I, I wanted to have a, a lot of variation in the size. I, I think I had read some other wordless books some years ago that had more of a graphic novel style with small pictures and large pictures. First of all, you can have more because it fits in, but it, it changes the mood. And as you said, suddenly the screen goes in color like the Wizard of Oz. I was thrilled. Can I ask you about the technicality of creating these images and particularly how you rendered the stone? That's part of the process and experimentation I was mentioning before. I tried to paint these scenes three different ways, which first and second didn't work well for all the environments. It would work well for the interiors and maybe characters, but not for these architectural scenes. So what I did eventually was to just paint black and white, only using black ash. And it worked really well because it has a kind of stone quality. It feels like I could sculpture with it, this black and white illustration. And it was really easy. Once I find that medium, it worked really well for all the environments, especially for these scenes of uh, architectural details. I was fascinated by what you were saying there, that some things work for one thing and not for another part of the book. But you had to work to get this unified feel. I, I think that's really very important. One of the earliest things I learned as an illustrator is work all the scenes, all the book at once, one stage for all and the second stage for the next level. So everything at the same time. When you begin to work, you don't feel it so much. You're not technically able to do as at the end of the process. So if you generate it like doing everything in steps, then you have this unified book, which is really important. I tend to sacrifice a really big amount of time to this search of thing that really feels right to me at that moment. Of course, it's not perfect. I always, at the end, I'm always sorry because I just see mistakes and what should be done better. But at that moment, it should be the optimum of what you're capable of. I want to contrast those big images of these iconic architectural places that you have in the book with something closer and more intimate. And the spread that I'm looking at that's in front of us at the moment, it's within the hospital. What kinds of choices did you have to make this scene work? It was very intimate. I felt it when I was reading Joanne's story, which is very tender and rich with this emotion. And I also understood it's very important to convey these feelings. I tend to re-feel inside and just return it in the illustration. So for these scenes, for example, I always 
use the same gestures or I do with my body what I'm supposed to draw or feel. What Maya said about doing the gestures herself, when I saw the mom read the letter saying that the aunt was ill and she put her hand on her chest, I thought, oh, I feel that. I really feel that. And I knew that Maya had felt it too. So that's why everything works so perfectly. The bodies are doing what shows how they feel. What is it that you are most pleased with the way that this book has turned out? Perhaps I can ask you first, Joellen. I would say that everything that I felt when I was writing it is there. And there's an extra layer of Maya's reaction. She understood it so well. So I can only say that I'm very happy at at how it turned out. Thank you, Joellen. It was a gift. You gave me an amazing gift and our readers. Maya, what about you? What were you most proud of? I think it was an an enormous project for me, both in terms of investigation, exploration of the theme. It was contrary to what Joellen said. She was very fond of gargoyles and familiar with it. I I wasn't actually. (laughs) I didn't ever think that much about it. And it was something completely new, both in this way, also in technical ways, and this uh, how to manage a project that big. So I think I'm really, I'm also really proud of it. I'd like to thank you both for joining me. Thank you so much for your conversation. It's been wonderful. It's certainly been a pleasure for me. Yeah, Yeah, it's wonderful for me too. (laughs) In the Reading Corner is presented by Nikki Gamble and produced by Alison Hughes. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review. If you would like to find out about other events and courses, visit justimagine.co.uk. Join us again in the Reading Corner on your favourite podcast platform.